How can marketing directors navigate the emerging agency trends effectively? And can you provide an example of a trend that maybe should be on a radar of these marketing agencies? The biggest trend that I'm seeing is this evolution of agency that is that knows what they're doing. They're the practitioner with a jetpack of ad tech that they can fly through, you know, their clients' portfolios and, and make an impact very quickly and do it efficiently. Um, but efficiency is not everything. It's really effectiveness. Where we were was channel-specific execution to a blend of now being in those channels and using ad technology to support it. And you're seeing a bunch of different methodologies. And I think the one that I believe will win is AI has been a hot topic, but it's how you're using this technology to, to reach, reach your business objective. Are you ready to navigate the revolution of advertising industry? This week on Facts Not Failings, we are diving into a seismic shift from VLAs to Performix Max. And I may have just hit a nerve on a lot of advertising agencies and advertisers as you're kind of like, oh my gosh, please don't say those words because we heard those and now we're in the fetal position. But with me today, I've got Vasilios Lamos, the mastermind behind Cognition Digital. Dot .io or just cognition digital if you want to shorten it a little bit. And with me today, like I said, we got we have Vasilios. So with that, welcome into Facts Not Feelings. I am your host, Brooke Furness. And today, as I stated before, we are joined by an industry trailblazer and Vasilios Lamos, the CMO and co-founder of Cognition Digital. And today he is going to be sharing his expert insights into the transition from VLAs to Performance Max, which we all saw that and we just kind of got a little, uh, we don't want to deal with this, but we're going to jump into today with what the new opportunities in ad tech and the dynamic evolution of agency trends. So, Vasilis, we're just going to jump right into this. So with that shift from VLAs to Performance Max is undoubtedly causing waves across our industry and the advertising industry. Could you highlight some of the challenges that this transition might pose and how brands can prepare for them? Well, if we uh, haven't been here before, uh, Google, <laughs> I love I love that line. Google tends to make changes uh, a lot. A lot. Uh, and, you know, I think the transition, you know, between VLA, Performance Max, um, for automotive, they've still been pretty consistent in creating ad placements that help um, dealers sell their inventory, uh, move, move metal, and obviously get uh, as low and uh, bottom funnel, high intent um, purchase behavior, you know, audiences to, to, the, to that inventory as quick as possible. I think when, uh, for dealers, it is going to be a challenge for um, that shift uh, in that campaign strategy. VLA typically has been a pretty low uh, cost per click format, a very high volume, high traffic um, volume placement. Really, it's it's new, uh, and you know, with a lot of those new placement placements, you tend to see a lot of early adopters take advantage of, um, you know, getting getting there first. But you also, um, you know, with Performance Max and some of the automated bidding that Google continues to place on, um, you know, the market. There's a huge challenge in managing your uh, cost metrics uh, as it pertains to uh, what's going to happen when that shift really sort of um, transitions. So, you know, again, Google, I think, is chasing um, dollars. And one way they can do that is really push more and more advertisers into performance max. Um, but there's a broader thesis here that I think we, we want to uncover, right? And, you know, you, you can't, I think no great marketer is going to sit here and, and just um, let, it, let things fly, right, in the sky and, you know, not care about their ad performance. I think at some level, everybody cares about their advertising performance. And so they're going to test, they're going to iterate, they're going to find the right media mix that's going to work for their stores, that's going to work for their brands. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, you know, 
tons of opportunity there. I think the bigger the bigger question I have is why change it up so much, right? Like huge difference in the two. What's the, the you know what, what's the reasoning behind it? And yeah, I'm sort of I get a little fed up because I feel like Google, you know, could be a better steward. Uh, of those ad dollars. Um, and I think they take the advertising dollars sometimes for granted, um, given their size. And, you know, we, uh, you know, and, and our partners and agencies and the marketing directors, I, you know, that I hold near and dear to my personal network. And, you know, we're all a little bit confused. Um, that being said, you know, we're going to obviously go with the change and see if we can't find ways to find more efficiency. Um, it does open up the, the door to other avenues. And, you know, I think Vince specific advertising, uh, although it's not, it wasn't invented, let's say by Google, I think, you know, everybody has some form of Vince specific, uh, targeting today. Um, you know, we're obviously well-versed in the programmatic aspect of VIN level targeting. And I, I see a lot of demand for that growing simply because you can target audiences one-to-one, -one, um, very specific in a DSP or demand side platform where these ads are served across the display network. Whereas you don't always have that control with, you know, Google, despite Google being in many cases, sometimes more bottom funnel uh, than a display ad. And, you know, you can argue, you know, based on the audience targeting, you know, programmatically, it's a little bit more mid funnel, whereas like Google can, could be at, at points in times more bottom funnel in the search query, but also very upper funnel when we're talking about VLA ads, because, you know, they, they're just showing inventory feeds based on search intent. And it's not always filtered, let's say down to the right audience, they're getting a breadth of inventory. Whereas, you know, if we know that a user has this very specific make model, programmatically, we can hit them with an exact match make model specific vehicle. And so you can actually be more targeted um, in some of those formats. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm always looking to test and I think it's going to be interesting to see uh, how that transition happens and, and where those dollars move overall as, as I think the market starts to feel a little bit less um, convinced that, that that was the right move by Google. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. I, I agree with that. And, and even how the money is spent, I mean, what you have to spend on a, a – any type of advertising for a PMAX versus VLA is very different. So building on that, how will this transition impact the way dealers and GMs strategize their marketing efforts and their advertising efforts? Yeah, I think there's a lot more uh, competition in the marketplace, especially as we move into the second half of the year. And what we're seeing is um, most of the uh, demand that we didn't see, let's say during COVID on the advertising side, uh, sort of coming back in a big way digitally and people, more so GMs that were at stores that really cut back on their ad spend during the pandemic um, are starting to really reinvigorate those budgets. And so there's this theme that I'm seeing where you still have a lot of owners and GMs who um, uh, have been more around like, let's be efficient. Let's do more with less. Let's, you know, and I'm all on board with that. I think that they're, they're not a hundred percent, you know, wrong, but if you see all of your competition increasing their advertising dollars, as a way to move back aggressively into the marketplace. There are a lot of um, general managers, a lot of dealerships that may be underspending uh, relative to their competition. Uh, and and that, that is something to you know, make note of because I don't think a lot of people are talking about, um, are talking about that you know, in, in its entirety. 
there are people definitely having client calls, right? And uncovering this when they look at, um, like I just got off a, a call and, you know, people were concerned about, you know, impression share and, and, and so forth. And, you know, I think share of voice is important for dealers and you can do that programmatically, you know, um, through streaming TV, you can push dollars in streaming audio, you can push dollars uh, way up or funnel to build brand. And we're starting to see that come back in a big way. And that's exciting. You know, it's, it's great for our business, right? Because, you know, we're ready. You know, we've, we've spent the last couple of years um, going through a harder advertising environment where people were very concerned about where their money's going, even more so now. But I think they're starting to realize that, yeah, you have to look at your media plan and you also have to look at your competition and you have to figure out, are, are your competitors spending in areas that you simply pulled back on or you are just not spending? And again, like I'm trying, you know, I, I, I think about this all the time. It's like, you know, the one thing a marketing director, a general manager, the last thing they want to hear is for their partner to say, you need to spend more money. Yeah. Right. Because then they're like, well, that's such a, it's such an easy answer. Well, no, it, it is like, and like, if you look at the data and you see your competitors come at you with a significantly higher budget and you're getting smoked in auction in the ad auction, not, I don't know about, you know, Mannheim or any of these automotive auctions, different story in an ad auction, you're getting outbid by your competitors well, yeah, you you will slow slowly roll down in that lead count, and you are going to see um, kind of issues there. Well, um, I think to, to talk to that as well as you bring up a good point is that there's a big difference between impression share loss to rank versus impression share loss to budget. Are you spending so little that you continue to get beat because you're not spending enough, or are you are you not are you spending too much and it's not being spent in the right areas? So, in understanding where where are you losing and how are you losing it, and really diving into that. And to your point is. I know that's something that personally I look at all the time, but how, are you actually having that conversation? And do you even know how to have that conversation? And is it, when you have it, are you really diving into it to understand where you're losing the impression share? Because that is a very, very key thing that you bring up. And that I am still shocked how many people don't look at that. It's like, oh, I had impressions. But what do those impressions mean? Because you can have 7,000, 10,000, 15,000 impressions. I don't care about the impressions. I want to know about the impression share. And where are you losing it? And then how can we capitalize on that? Because the other thing you brought up about is, okay, we just spend more money, but you have to have so much of trust build up with XYZ agency, whatever it may be, whether that's with cognition or edit, whatever it may be, to say, okay, why are we spending more money? Okay, you've done X, Y, and Z. All right, well, I know that I go back to the 2020 and we bring in 2021 and everyone was jumping on board and saying they could do OTT, stream or whatever. And everyone was crawling out, as you well know, from a rock saying they could do streaming. I was like, you can't. Like there were uh, some really great players that could in, in particular. Cognition, you guys do a phenomenal job with Amazon advertising. And there were other people that were saying they could do X, Y, Z and they just really couldn't. But they were very quick to take a dealer's money. I go, OK, now let's say you've got a great partner. In 2021, 20, you're trying to measure year over year how 2020 was. And it was just like, what, what are you doing? You can't have that same conversation and spend the same amount yeah. and think they're going to get the same results. 2020 was completely different. And then, so you bring up a good point once again to, to say, are we spending more and why are we spending more? And what, what does success look like? So I love that you brought that up. And to take this a step further is that we just happen to mention about Amazon advertising and how does that Amazon advertising assist brands in over, overcoming these challenges of transitioning to Performance Max? You know, the biggest thing with Performance Max has always been, you know, we're trying to maximize conversion data. We're trying to get the best bottom funnel, bottom funnel data. And I think, you know, it, it really, it really, it comes down to how you're, and again, Performance Max is very siloed to Google, right? So let's just, you know, for the, anybody who doesn't know, um, you know, they, they want to pull, you know, I think from Google's perspective, they want marketers and advertisers, they want more automation because it, in many cases, in some cases, automation is great. In some cases, it's not, right? And I think a lot of the algorithms that, you know, are built into Google, sometimes they're really, really good. 
for dealers, I think sometimes they're not because dealers need to be more meticulous about um, how they're advertising very specific inventory. Smart. Yeah, smart right. campaigns for dealers, not necessarily great. They're not necessarily smart. <laughs> right. So, you know, there is there is this like mantra of like, or the, I feel like we're seeing more and more of this like move to going back to using technology to aid your advertising to improve your attribution. Uh, and that's going to be a big area is like, you know, if you are reluctant to lean into automated bidding, you're still using automated bidding ultimately like out of the box, regardless of your bid strategy. So if I'm using like enhanced cost per click or enhanced CPC, you still have to go in there and adjust bids and still understand, you know, where you're putting those dollars. And I think that that's a great thing because it gives the advertiser control. Yeah. Um, but with that, you also need really good attribution. The same thing, is, you know, when we look at a lot of the agencies that we partner with, um, they're leaning into us for attribution and measurement because we can create audience strategies, we can create uh, attribution strategies that um, with, alongside our technology act as like a clean room and I think that's a big black box or it's kind of a unknown territory for channels like Google and Facebook. Uh, they're not maximizing it the same way. Um, and we've kind of got a head start because we were in the programmatic space. Um, but it's continuing to be an area where dealers could be a little bit more dangerous with their first party data and the, um, audience strategies that they're deploying. So, you know, I think there's, you know, performance max aside, right? Like there is a lot of value in um, being more meticulous in picking and choosing the technologies that you use in your media mix. And then secondary to that, uh, making sure that the, you know, there's, there's so much good tech out there um, but if you're not actually using it, you're not putting it to work in your in your media strategy, you're missing out on the upside, right? And the, the best example I can give to transition the conversation a little bit is, you know, clean rooms. Let's say we are running advertising, you know, so an, an advertiser or dealer is using their agency, they're running an advertisement on the trade desk. And that impression is being delivered um, to the consumer we can match that impression to a vehicle sale uh, using the Amazon Marketing Cloud uh, and our Cognition and Clean Room essentially resolves the identity of that user and then allows us to then advertise to that user uh, on other channels like Amazon as well. So you have the ability to create audience segments and measure attribution cross channel, cross media channels. Um, and it provides a lot of value, right? Because most advertisers, agencies, maybe dealers in this case, were spending significant amount of money in a, in a channel or programmatically, and they didn't have the full picture because they didn't know what that sales uplift may have looked like. And so Google today doesn't really even offer that, right? So you have, you know, it might be more bottom funnel. That might be a, a pretty good hypothesis. I would agree in many cases, you know, a, a paid search ad is more, bottom funnel than a streaming TV ad. Um, but you still would like, you know, I think brands and, and dealers are still going to want to understand, right, how do I optimize for sales, right, which is, which in many cases may be the goal, you know, or is ultimately the goal of the campaign. Um, so I'll leave you, I'll leave you with, with that um, for a moment, but that's sort of where my head goes is, you know, it's, it's really about um, you know, outside of bid strategies and how you're pulling levers, you know, uh, from a macro level, right? How are you um, combining that with how you're measuring success? And are you using that measurement strategy and analysis to really inform your, uh, your media plan? Or are you just doing it because you feel like you have to? And I think there's people who are reluctant to do the work uh, and then find out that it's really not that much work to kind of take it to the next level. 
So you brought up multiple things. You got you brought up Amazon. We've sold, you've got VLAs. You've got Performance Max that you just brought in there and about metrics. So I'm going to save the metric question for a second here, but I want to go into a little bit about the context of transition from VLAs to Performance Max, PMX, whatever the heck you want to call them. How does the change? How does this change the competitive landscape between Amazon and Google? Because they're two different things. So how would you say that that changes the competitive landscape? Yeah, I think where Google loses trust with dealers, uh, Amazon and other channels will gain it. So, you know, it is a lot more competitive. There are a lot more options today for dealers to advertise uh, and deploy event specific level advertising and to deploy it with really good efficiency. So, you know, I think that's, that's the big thing that um, I'm seeing is, you know, you're not, you know, Google doesn't have the same amount of leverage that they used to have. Um, and that's a great, great thing for the market. I mean, I couldn't be more excited, uh, you know, <laughs> in the end of the day, knowing that my, you know, my ability to advertise uh, is not limited by a change that, it, you know, a channel partner may have done. Agreed. And and you brought up something, and before I go on the metrics question here, you had brought up something I wanted to circle back on about trust, about low funnel versus high funnel. And one thing, there's a, if people are not a familiar with Amazon advertising, you and I, how we did a show, it's probably it's been over a year ago. And go back and watch it if you're not familiar with Amazon advertising. Just one thing I want to bring up is that I would I would go on to say that I think Amazon advertising may even be lower funnel because you're now getting someone that you know their address. It's not one, two, three, four Main Street. It's someone that you know is actually, you know that the information is accurate because they've willingly given it to Amazon. They've said, hey, I've got Amazon Garage. I've put my information in there. You now can market them to whatever you want to do, whether that's I want to do a conquest. I want to do, I need to get rid of some you know, parts or I want to do a truck month campaign. I want to do whatever. And now you're actually able to, to market them knowing who they are, where they where they actually are. And if they actually then move, they're going to update their address because they don't want their shipments going to the wrong the wrong uh, address. So I, and I don't have the stats off my top of my head of how, how that compares when it comes to if they're lower funnel or not. But that just got me thinking when you said, hey, they're lower funnel. I was like, ah, I, you know, I'd be curious to know if they are or not. So with as you as I brought that up and I started thinking about that, I was like, okay, that that would kick this into with the measurement part or with the new advent of new measurements, techniques, and ad tech. How do you ensure that Amazon advertising stays in front, stays at the forefront of these developments? Yeah, well, I think the the biggest thing is that you know, yeah, we we're, we're a big leader in the Amazon space. We're becoming a lot more DSP agnostic. Um, from a technology perspective, that's been uh, a huge benefit for us. So, you know, at, you know, from a cognition standpoint, it's not really going to matter a, a ton. You know, when we're talking programmatic, there's so many, uh, opp- you know, opportunities for you to for dealers to invest in programmatic outside of Amazon DSP. Um, we're still going to stand by that Amazon has some of the best first party automotive data that I've seen in the marketplace. Um, and we're very fortunate that we've built a uh, kind of a, a leading solution for dealers and auto in general. Um, but we are looking in other industries as well. And, and, you know, I think there's a ton of learnings to, um, to come out of that. Uh, I think a lot of it's going to come down to data privacy and protection and, you know, the, the big piece with data privacy is having the ability to um, have a safe area to uh, deliver audience segmentation. And you really can't do that with a, a pixel and third-party um, cookies. You know, you, you have to use some form of um, safe, secure cloud um, solution like a, a clean room Um you know, where, where it's data is being uploaded, is being stored in a privacy safe environment, is being anonymized. There's no exposure to PII. There's no exposure to um, that customer information. And those universal identifiers are used to then 
you know, activate in your media, right? So you can use that, those identifiers and you can put it to work, right? Without um, being, you know, against privacy law. Um, so I think uh, Amazon's done a phenomenal job in that space. They are the lead, I would say, on the technology side when you think about the reach that uh, AWS has and where that sits at a macro level. Um, not to say that Google hasn't dabbled in this space. I just think that Google's number one advertising channel doesn't really allow, I think, for um, the same level of assurances that you get out of the box with a programmatic buy, um, you know, leveraging some of those solutions and, and clean rooms. I would agree with that. <laughs> I mean, we did a, I did a, uh, this is a while ago, I did an episode on just, you know, there's, and not that, not that other companies don't get sued. The DOG is also suing Google for a reason. I we, Google is important, don't get me wrong. And anyone that's looking to do Amazon advertising, I will also say, does that mean you get rid of Google? No, it doesn't mean you get rid of Google. There's just this is another tool in your tool belt. So knowing that, how can marketing agencies make the most of the new ad tech opportunities for measurement? And the follow-up that's going to be was what kind of data should they focus on? There's there, you know, I think all, all data and metrics are important. The more metrics you can have, the better. Ensuring that you're aligning your metrics when you talk about this is this is a bigger this is the bigger piece. It's not about the metrics. Me metrics are just a tool to tell the story, right? With your ad performance, if you don't know how to tell that story, you don't know which metrics to look at. And so, if if you marketing one on one, you're looking at a marketing funnel. You need to be able to identify those metrics top to bottom of the funnel right down to the sale, down to the conversion. And so having the ability to tell that story is, is really important. I think, you know, taking a step back, you know, I'm not here to tell you what the most important metric is or to tell dealers what the most important me metric is because it may be different um, from time to time. But if you are interested in solving a business problem, like your leads are down or you're not getting the... Uh, you know, you're not moving the inventory you need to move for a specific make model, whatever the issue may be. Maybe it's your RO count, your service department needs support. Um, having the ability to look at a campaign and understand how that demand is being captured, looking at that traffic uh, and going from top of funnel to the bottom of the funnel, you're going to be able to identify, right, uh, where things are falling off, whether that's, you know, uh, you, your traffic might be perfectly fine. You might have you know, a situation where you gained impression share, you captured more, um, you know, you captured a higher click-through rate for the month. So people were clearly clicking through to your ads. The personalization of that ad was there. You were reaching the right audience. But when you looked at your conversion rate, it was down, right? And there were issues on site. There were changes that may have been made that your agency wasn't even um, aware of. And so these, there's so many questions you can ask when it comes to you know, what's the most important metric? I would say, you know, the most important important metric is the metric that's telling uh, that, that, that part of the story, the digital marketing story that will ultimately help you optimize um, your media plan and, and gear that media plan towards uh, the objectives you're looking to hit. And I would go on to say as well is that what is the, the metric that makes success to you? Because how many times do you go on to onboard a new client or your monthly reports? And if you haven't had that conversation with your client to say, all right, what is important to you? And they say, oh, it's people in the door. And if you didn't have that conversation before and you're like, OK, it, it's got to be clicks for us or it's got to be view throughs. And so as as the. As, as the agency, you're like, oh, God, we just kicked ass on the views and we click, we kicked ass on the clicks and the dealership's like, we had one person come to the door. And so now the dealership's pissed off. And so the measurement they were trying to tra track was how many people were coming to the door, agency tracking something else. And they think they just knocked it out of the park. Well, that's the measure you should probably be tracking. So going back to the, you know, the story you're trying to tell or the, you know, making it success, but looking and saying, okay, what does success look like to you? and make sure we are 100% tracking that. But also understand why is it important to them? Is it because they're trying to you know, 
reach a certain goal or because they're trying to sell more cars. Obviously, everyone's trying to sell more cars. But why is it so important to them? And how are we going to obtain that goal? Yes, more people in the, in the door is going to sell cars. But all these other things lead up to that as well. So, I, yeah, I, I would agree with that as well. What does the future of ad measurement, kind of going off this a little bit more, ad, ad, uh, ad measurement look like? And how will these advancements help in a better campaign performance tracking? You know, measurement solutions, this is going to be Cognition's wheelhouse. Um, and, you know, we're going to be talking about this. I'm going to be talking about measurement solutions the entire month uh, and beyond because we've really been pushing our product towards being a measurement solution first and then a great media activation solution uh, second in many ways. And so we are hyper concerned about breaking down walled gardens and we don't want people not having the full picture of their advertising spend. And so if you're spending a dollar with us, you are going to get everything from, you know, and I say with us, I say, if you're spending it through our platform, wherever, Roku, Amazon, Samsung, you know, doesn't matter. You are going to get a picture of performance uh, and it's going to be attributed to bottom funnel traffic, right? Foot traffic, sales, actual like, leads and sales data, not just a a click conversion. We'll have every single uh, ability to measure, right? On-site, off-site, so online, offline, um, in a way that is going to really inform um, how you're you're personalizing those ads, how you're um, delivering those media dollars and and figuring out where you want to spend it month to month. So that's a big part of the future for not only uh, dealers, this is this is a ad agency level conversation that we're having because we that is our target customer. We directly work with um, the ad agencies in the marketplace to provide those products so that they go to their um, dealer partners and they are able to offer a solution that's giving them um, a full funnel picture of their advertising performance. And uh, you know, it's. We do it in a very specific, you know, in very specific channels, right? Like it's mainly programmatic media. So it's mainly Amazon DSP, you know, it's going to be Roku, it's going to be Samsung trade desk and so forth. But, um, you know, that's a big part of the media budget, obviously in the marketplace. And so, you know, we see those trends across the board. You're seeing reporting solutions, you're seeing uh, the hot uh, topic around CDP. uh, And I'll post uh, an article to help. Um, <laughs> define what a CDP is in, in my eyes, but you know it's it's using your customer data and ultimately being able to deliver hyper targeted campaigns that are going to drive business results. It's going to drive lifetime value, right, for you, for the brand and for your customers. So you know you can't. It's not just about being in the new channel. It's not about oh TikTok's running ads now. Let's just go buy TikTok ads. You know that might not be your target audience, right? Um, I'm not saying it, there's definitely value in TikTok, but, you know, having the full picture and making sure you can measure performance is going to be very, very important. I'd button up that first before I go and I just spend in every new channel I can find because, you know, there is a diminishing return in just being everywhere with a small budget versus dialing in, you know, full measurement and optimization capabilities on your core three to four channels, Versus I'm on 10 channels, but I'm not really making an impact. Um, and so those are just some of my kind of thoughts. But, you know, that's that's how, you know, marketing is such a such a learn, iterate, test and iterate space. Um, you know, I'm, I may be biased. I, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, digital marketer, right? Only not, not big on the traditional side. I'm going to tell you. Right, that attribution is important as it pertains to digital. Um, but you know, direct mail. We've seen direct mail companies do pretty pretty well, right? They they can use their lists and geo targeting to get you know the right mailer in your mailbox. Um, you know, so there's there's solutions out there. Is it efficient? I think that's where the question comes into play. And most of the dollars you see moving into digital for programmatic is coming off of the backbone of cable TV. It's coming off of these local um, TV um, uh, providers that, you know, they're not getting the same CPM 
as you're seeing on a programmatic ad. And, and I think dealers are in the market are starting to wake up to go, wait one sec, I'm spending double what I may be spending in this other channel. Right. And those are just high level. Right. Um, it, and I think I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to know that you're spending double right for a specific audience um, or, or an audience you have nothing you don't know anything about. Right. You may be buying a placement versus an audience. And I think those are also um, things to consider. But attribution is big. Measurement is going to be number one. Um, and, and, and using that data to optimize your strategy is uh, ultimately the goal. Yeah, there and there are so many different platforms, and like even with myself, I was like, okay, everyone, I I held off going on TikTok up until about a couple months ago, just because I was like, I that is so a generation below me. <laughs> like, I I don't know anything about TikTok, and I don't pretend to, but I was like, okay, I I you know I've got you don't move on until you've mastered the other ones or, at least, you know, or, or at least semi-proficient at it. And it's still like, I'm still trying to figure out the whole TikTok situation. The only reason I do is because I have a brand. And so to try to just, okay, there's threads. So we got to jump on threads. I like when threads came out, I, I literally just, uh, I just felt every single digital marketer just be like, for the love, don't, don't bring it up in the meeting. Please don't bring it up in the meeting. Like it's so me, every single meme, like went through my head of a, of someone being like, Oh, so we need to be on threads. I'm like, how about you just pump the brakes until we get everything else under control before we jump on that. But with the whole, all these different trends that are coming out, whether it's a social media platform, whether it's whatever, you know, you said CDP, and I think we've hit about every buzzword bingo there is to have during this conversation. How can marketing directors navigate the emerging agency trends effectively? And can you provide an example of a trend that maybe should be on a radar of these marketing agencies or for a digital marketer? Trends. Yeah. A biggest, the biggest trend is breaking down walled gardens using, um, Clean rooms, identity resolution, and DSPs, um, and I think the the big uh, the big opportunity area there for programmatic advertising is a much higher targeted impression, a much more I would say fluid um, integration, you know, uh, uh, in, environment where uh, you can integrate with a bunch of different technology stacks. Um, and, and that trend is accelerating, like it is, it is very healthy. Like the agencies are really starting to invest in it. And I think that's, you know, they're, they're where we, where we, where we were and where we're going, right. Where we were was channel specific, right. Um, execution to a blend of now being in those channels and using ad technology to support it. And you're seeing a bunch of different methodologies. And I think the one that I believe will win is you still need, and, and this goes, but, you know, we talk, we, we've covered CDP, but we've covered, you know, we haven't covered really AI. AI has been a hot topic. A lot of these buzzwords are in the media, but it's how you're using this technology to, to reach, reach your business objective. It's how you're getting things done, right. For marketers and ad agencies. So, you know, I, I'm not a all hands off because what I've seen is I've been out there testing platforms. There are some platforms that don't fully, and, and, and this is, you know, this is built, we're building our own platform, right? Like we're in it, we're developing and designing, right? Products for advertisers. And you learn very quickly, right? There's some stuff that is, are useful. There's some stuff that are useful if you use it. Yes. Right. So I think that's the big, the biggest trend that I'm seeing is this evolution of agency that is, that knows what they're doing. They're the practitioner with um, a jetpack of ad tech that they can fly through, you know, their clients' portfolios and, and make an impact very quickly and do it efficiently. Um, but efficiency is not everything, right? I think you can't uh, be in this space. Uh, and look at that trend and, and say it's all about efficiency. It's not just about efficiency. It's really effectiveness. And, you know, I had a mentor of mine who told me that a while back and it is never like it, it has, it's unwavering, right? Like it's, 
it's been that way forever. I've never seen that change all about the having effective advertising. And you can do that if you're using the right products and tools, um, uh, you know, in your mix, but that's the biggest trend. I mean, it's not just AI, it's, it's how, uh, agencies are using technology to make, you know, um, deliver better results, deliver better attribution, better creative, um, all of that. So, uh, that's going to continue and it's only going to get, the space is only getting more and more busy with, um, tech providers out there with tools and so forth. Um, and so if you're ever confused or ever sort of, you know, I would, I would say don't like well, one thing for auto, right. is like, don't jump so quickly to that next solution and providers. Yes. Like the hot new thing on the block was like, let's do a free, let's do a test. Let's do a free, whatever, you know, and free demo and this and that, and like a one month, this one month, that. And you can't see in a really? month how things are. That's what drives me bonkers. You need 90 days minimum to know how things are going. But you're like, oh, 30-day trial. Okay. I'm like, but then you're just going to pull the plug and not know how anything is doing in 30 days. Ah. <laughs> right. And I and I honestly would give your existing partners benefit of the doubt because yep. the market's really small. Uh, and you'd be very surprised, I think, at how intertwined this marketplace is. And so small everybody is jumping on the bandwagon at some point. Like you cannot look at attribution and clean rooms, right? Like we were talking about, um, you can't look at measurement products and think that one agency has it and one agency doesn't and that agency is just going to win. Like, no, like no. that other agency just has not signed up or has not, you know, pulled they're, it into their yeah. suite of solutions. They're, they're slowly ramping it up due to most yeah. likely legal reasons because it's, when it comes to AI, there's multiple legal, and I use AI 98% of my day. And there's a reason why, there's also a reason why that I don't have certain AI on my website because of legal reasons, I don't have it on my website. And there's reasons why certain agencies don't have it on the, in the so until you truly understand it and understand the lane where it resides, I mean, case in point, I was using this morning and it's the same prompt that I use for the same six prompts I use for a certain uh, work. And I, and it's like, I can get the same, I can get 12 different answers, but it's the same prompt. So understand that's AI and it's going to make mistakes. Like it's, that's so it's slow down to slow down and understand that's phenomenal. And it's great and fantastic, but also understand that's a robot. And it's just really impressive, uh, predictive text, just like we have on our phone. Like when it pops up and says, oh, you mean this? Like it means, it means duck you. And I'm like, no, that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. <laughs> that's not what I meant. It's just like that on steroids. So I, very, very wise words that you just said there. So thank you for that. It, yeah. As you bring that up about this, we were talking about these agency trends. How does, whether it's Cognition Digital and Amazon advertising, how do they accommodate new agency trends and compared to Google's approach because it's it is a little different. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think you know Google Google's done a great job of leaning into their industries with leadership and thought leadership and partners and so forth. Um, but I feel like everybody's a Google Premier partner, right? <laughs> like, yeah. uh, and a lot of it's like, and and in the end of the day, like Amazon and Google are very, and all channels are very similar in the sense that like there are spend requirements, right? Like yep. people have to get paid on their end. And, and it's not our, a little. It, right. It's a lot. Like, you know, it, to run and build technology is expensive. So I get it. Um, I think the biggest difference that I think what's lack, I mean, if, if I were to look at what's lacking is sort of that investment piece um, on the Google side. Like they're, they're not really like, they're not literally giving, I think, agencies the money to build solutions themselves. Like they hold that near and dear, whereas like other channels are a lot more flexible in kind of how they're investing with partners and spending time with those partners to build and solve customer pain points. Um, and so that's, that's really what I see is like, you know, I think you want to be with a provider or with a technology provider that's going to be super transparent it's going to involve you in the process. Like our partners are specifically our agency partners are very involved in telling us what works and what doesn't work. 
Um, and we're constantly back to the drawing board. We're constantly building, you know, for things that are going to materialize a year plus out in terms of um, growth and opportunity. And, you know, I think Google's a little bit behind for being such a large company. The changes they're making, these are these are changes that clearly are were not. And we'll, we'll go back. The reason we brought VLA up performance max is because there are other, right? The theme here, right? If, if nobody understood it after 45 minutes is there are other channels you can invest in. Yes. Uh, right. Not going to ask for it, but I'll point to it. <laughs> um, and I, I think that's that, you know, that change, if it was a shock to our industry and our marketing leadership and in, in automotive, it should, you should think about that and be like, well, wait one sec. Like Google's not listening to their customer, right? Like they're just doing things that may or may not benefit themselves. And, you know, that's, that's where I sort of, you know, that's, that's where I'm saying like, they need to do a better job, right. Of leaning into their partners because their partners have the roadmap, right. Like, um, and the media is painting this picture, like that they're just playing catch up in a lot of different areas. And, it's 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 wild to see such a large company with so much leverage and so much demand. Like nobody's gonna stop Googling tomorrow. No, right? like, that's what's so wild is like, you know, it's it's not just gonna overnight. This, their business is gonna disappear, and so they'll have they'll have flexibility to learn and make mistakes. But yeah, it, it hurts to see kind of you know a company that size. You know, whereas like I've been in a room. Um, with some Google executives back in the day and had the, you know, I was fortunate enough to be on teams with large budgets that put me in the room with the right leadership, you know? And I felt like, you know, you get all this special treatment and then like you look at the retail tier three market and you're doing it at scale and you feel like that market is just getting, they're getting left behind. Like they're, they're not really getting listened to in the same manner. And it's like, you know, if only that methodology were reversed, what great products, right? A company like Google could really build out um, and not just favor the big guys, right? Who are, uh, you know, spending all this money and may or may not know what they're talking about. <laughs> so. Minor, minor uh, detail, minor detail. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Basilis, I, I thank you so much. This has been a, I'd say a much needed conversation something that's very prevalent in what we're going, we're, our whole industry is going through right now. And I cannot thank you so much for being on the show again and teaching and learning, uh, having us all learn from your, your amazing brain and your knowledge. I so appreciate that. And with that, it is now time for the lightning round with Vasilios. So Vasilios, I know that you've been on the show before, so we're going to try to mix up the questions a little bit here for you. But first and foremost, for all those that are watching right now, we've got Vasilios is little personalized link here for everyone watching but for those that are listening how can they get in touch with you how can they find you i am a linkedin influencer in this space i say that because although i might not have the same virality and follows and likes and subscribers uh, i am very active on the platform so you know i if you have an idea or you have a question um, I created uh, my first newsletter. I'm going to plug it because hell, I'm putting a ton of great information on on that newsletter with definitions, and I'm trying to go into it um, and just produce a lot of it, a lot of content that people can just reference. You can go to my profile. You, you can go to the newsletter uh, if you have a question on it. Great, like, and I'm I'm open to powwow, you know, on there too. Like, people message me all the time. And they're like, hey, I'm using so-and-so or I have a, you know, a solution for this uh, and that, right? So, you know, I'm not going to tell you whether it's right or wrong. I'm only going to tell you, you know, what's out there and, and how to make it better. And, um, yeah, that's I, I, that's my core kind of place. You can also go to, um, you know, cognitiondigital.io um, if you're interested in, in kind of, you know, if you're an agency and you're interested in, um, figuring out if there's a better measurement solution or a better way to target uh, programmatically, build campaigns programmatically. Um, that's sort of our sweet spot. So, Love it. 
Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Name of the show is Facts Not Feelings. So whether it's in your personal life or in your professional life, how are you distinguishing facts from feelings? Facts can't be changed. <laughs> no, they can't. So, um, you know, if it's a fact, it's most likely proven um, or not. But feelings, yeah, I mean, how am I distinguishing that? Uh, I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm definitely a, you know, I, I have a really good gut feeling on certain things. Um, so much so that sometimes I would debate if I'm indicating something's factual or not. Um, but yeah, I mean, I try, to, I try to look for the source, you know, on everything in the end of the day. Love it. Um, and using data is always going to be the North Star, right? Like, look at the data meticulously. Like, that is ultimately going to be factual, hopefully. Um, but if it's not, <laughs> double check your tracking. <laughs> Uh, GA4, what? What is that? Yeah. <laughs> you set up those conversion events properly or not? Uh, do you have a yeah, definition set up? Probably not. Okay, let's go look at that. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Okay, let's go with what book are you, cur- what, either what book are you currently reading or what is one of your favorite books? Oh, boy. That's a really good question. Oh, I, I try, I try. And this is supposed to be a lightning round. and I, like, <laughs> We're going to have to edit it. I'm, so it like, is. <laughs> I had a book that like came to mind okay. and it's like a book that I don't want to say for all the like wrong reasons. Cause I want to like pull the leadership book that I was just reading, you know, out of the mix. Okay. Um, but I read, I read, uh, I read a while back, uh, reminiscence of a stock operator. Okay. Nice. Okay. We'll take it. We'll take and, it. What I love about that book is even though it's related to like stock trading, it talks a lot about the dynamic of emotion, right? As, as stock traders make business decisions and trades and so forth. And like, we make those decisions in other fields, right? So, you know, if you're a marketer, you're, you're having kind of a sixth sense, right? You're listening to somebody who's like, you need a CDP, you should use it. You should sign up tomorrow, right? Like how you make those decisions for that, you know, and, and predict, whether or not it's going to be a, or the right or wrong decision, I think is an interesting um, methodology, right? Like how our how our minds work uh, is such an interesting topic, and I think that book, um, obviously, in more in the financial sector, but is very applicable uh, in other industries as well. So, uh, I'll take it. Well, hopefully, this is an easy question. What is your favorite car? We'll end with the, that one. Oh boy! Oh gosh! I would say uh, I would say. Um, if money were not a, a thing and I could buy whatever car I want, I would say the 458 Ferrari. Um, it's like the Italia, I think, mm-hmm. or whatever. Yep. Oh. That, that one is uh, there's something about that car that, you know, is just so beautiful. And it's probably a fortune to maintain, but. If you can afford you know, the car, you can afford to maintain it. Like, I'm just going to put it out. Right. There. Yeah. Like, I think I, it'll be okay. It, yeah. <laughs> It would, if you if you own that car, you obviously yeah. <laughs> I what saw I, I saw a thing the other day that it was uh, every red it was I think from 1998 to present day every red uh, Ferrari. It was oh it was so uh, I was drooling a little bit over it. So now I, I I hear you. That's gorgeous vehicles, gorgeous yeah, very very pretty. So good answer. I wonder if that, I wonder if that's the car I said last time too. I was. I'll, I'll have to go back and look. I honestly, I don't remember. I'll have to go back and watch it though. Yeah, we'll, we'll do a little comparing back and forth. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. Awesome. Um, well, Vasilios, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much for uh, the yeah. wonderful insights on VLAs and performance packs. I super, super appreciate it. And with that, everyone, as always, find a way to serve today. Find a way to help your fellow colleague, your neighbor, whether it is opening up a door or a kind smile. And with that, everyone, we will see everybody next week. 